right, guys. Uh, let's get started. We have already finished all the lectures on uh, cement and concrete materials. Uh, the next couple of lecture we will focus on non-destructive testing. Okay. Um, first of all, what is non-destructive testing? Uh, NDT or NDE means non-destructive testing or evaluation. Okay. So these are tests that does not impair the intended performance of the structure members. Uh, but it can measure the physical properties of the floor, uh, especially the floor inside the structure, uh, without impairing the strength, the strengths and other performance of the uh, structures. Okay. Uh, it is to detect floor, especially we cannot see, such as uh, the cracks inside the welding, okay, or the bonding between the rebar and concrete, or any internal cracks inside concrete or that other materials. Okay. So the reason we need to perform NDT on concrete, okay, so uh, in the US, uh, oh, sorry, right here. So many industrialized nations uh, dedicate a lot of uh, construction budget for restoration, repair, and maintenance of old structures okay, uh, as compared to new constructions. Okay. So the US, uh, they spend around $6 trillion on concrete almost every year. Okay. Uh, this is an uh, old result about 30 years ago. Okay. So in 1991, the US DOT report that uh, $91 billion required for rehabilitation and repair of heavy infrastructure. Okay. And before we do the repair, uh, typically a need test is uh, required. Okay. So in 1997, uh, the cost risen to 200 billion. Okay. Uh, NDT can be used for concrete on um, quality assurance of new construction. Okay, uh, for example, uh, we want to check the strength development of concrete. Uh, we can also check the rebar location, the depth rebar, and also the bonding between the rebar and concrete. Okay. Uh, troubleshooting problems with new construction, uh, such as cracking due to thermal expansion, high temperature, okay. uh, dry shrinkage or due to loading. Okay. Uh, condition evaluation of old concrete okay. uh, and quality assurance of concrete repairs, uh, such as internal floor, uh, corrosion, uh, and also uh, bonding problems. Okay. Uh, Uh, NTT can also rapidly assess a large volume of concrete okay, uh, because uh, normally the instrument is smaller compared to a, a traditional test. Okay. And we cannot bring the compressive machine to the construction site. So normally we use NTT method uh, to decide in situ property such as the strength and other performance of uh, of concrete. The most important NDT test of all is bridge inspection. So we check uh, the condition of concrete using our eye. Okay. Uh, actually, we use visual inspection uh, before we do any type of other NDT method. Uh, it can give valuable information to a well in trained person. Okay. Uh, for example, if we see uh, the pattern of the crack, location, the size of the crack, uh, we probably can know possible causes uh, of the deterioration of concrete. Okay. So 
So uh, visual inspection is a fundamental inspection method. It can provide valuable information about location, uh, the type of surface damage, okay, and uh, also uh, the proper cause of distress. Okay, uh, for example, uh, if the crack is due to corrosion, uh, we may see the spotting of uh, concrete cover, okay, above the rebar. Okay, we may also see the surface stain uh, coming out of uh, the cracks. Okay, uh, this is the because of the corrosion product. For cracks due to acrylic reaction or ASR, uh, we may say uh, the crack pattern as matte crack. So we also we may also see the, the whitish gel coming out of the cracks. Okay. Uh, again, almost always use visual inspection to supplement other NDE ND method. Okay. And its effectiveness is largely governed by experience and the knowledge of the inspector. Okay, uh, then let's look at the classification of NDT method uh, on concrete materials. Okay, uh, the first category of NDT method is testing techniques which are based on mechanical testing to estimate the strength of concrete. Uh, such as rebound hammer, probe penetration measure, and pull out test. Uh, these tests are measuring the surface hardness of the concrete and can somehow give us the idea of the strength of the concrete. Okay. So the first one we're going to discuss is the surface hardness measure. Okay. So the surface hardness measure uh, consists of impacting a concrete surface uh, in a standard manner uh, with the rebound hammer. Okay. And rebound hammer is the most commonly used measure uh, to check the strength development of concrete. Uh, it has another name, it's called Jimmy rebound hammer. Inside the hammer, it has a spring-controlled hammer uh, that imparts on a plunger. Okay, uh, as we can see from here, uh, the total weight of the rebound hammer is around 1.8 kilogram. Okay, and inside the rebound hammer, we have hammer, uh, plunger, and also we have spring. Okay, so what we do is we push uh, the plunger onto the surface of a concrete vertically. Okay, and second point, uh, the spring will be released. Okay. And depending on the surface hardness of the concrete, uh, the rebound of the plunger, uh, we can give a so-called surface hardness from number 10 to number 100, okay, with a higher number uh, corresponding to a higher surface hardness. So again, the rebound method gave us uh, a measurement of surface hardness. Okay. Now there's many parameters controlling the surface hardness of the concrete. Uh, one of them is the strength of concrete. Uh, other factors such as uh, how much aggregate, uh, what type of aggregate, or even a surface moisture of concrete can also somehow affect the surface hardness. So we cannot compare uh, the surface hardness uh, or rebound number for different type of concrete. Okay. However, for the same type of concrete, we can compare the rebound number and that uh, somehow estimate the strength of concrete. So if the concrete is not strong enough, uh, the rebound hammer may generate a dent on the surface of the concrete. As we can see here, uh, this is a concrete for only uh, eight hours of age. Okay. So when you apply the rebound hammer, uh, remember to apply the hammer vertically on the surface of the concrete and push the hammer slowly 
until the, uh, the spring is released. So the second method is called probe penetration. Uh, this method is also to measure the surface hardness of concrete. So that's another name for probe penetration is called uh, Windsor probe. Okay. So Windsor probe use a powder activity driver and fire a hardened alloy probe into the concrete. Okay. And based on the penetration depths, uh, we can have an idea of the surface hardness. Okay. So uh, this method is a semi-destructive uh, part of a concrete actually is damaged by the probe. Okay. So here shows the size, the diameter of the probe. Okay. Again, this method is to measure the surface hardness, uh, but other properties such as the type and amount of algae uh, is also important to affect the penetration depths. Okay. So this method together with the uh, rebound hammer is very good to measure the relative rate of stress development of concrete at early age. Okay. So for example, we check uh, the penetration of the rebound number at one day, three day, or seven days. Okay. So we can have an idea of the stress development okay. because the concrete does not change. Uh, uh, for example, the, the type of algae, the water cement ratio, the moisture content does not really change. Uh, the only thing change is the stress. Okay. So whatever change for the penetration of the rebound number, uh, that is because of the change in the stress. Okay. But again, we cannot compare different uh, type of concrete for the penetration. Okay. So here shows uh, some of the results. Uh, the strength of the concrete and uh, expose the probe labs. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, how deep uh, the probe can penetrate. Okay. Uh, as we can see, for different type of algae, this is the uh, gravel number three and uh, gravel number seven. So different type of gravel, uh, the correlation between uh, the strength of concrete and exposed probe lengths are quite different. However, for the same type of uh, mixed proportion, for the same type of algae, uh, we have a almost linear correlation between exposed probe lengths and the strength of concrete. So the third method uh, about surface hardness is called pull-out test. Okay. So for pull-out test, uh, we need to cast this specially shaped steel insert uh, into a fresh concrete. Okay. So this is for new concrete, uh, not for existing concrete. Okay. This steel insert is then pulled out from the concrete and we measure how much force is required for that pull out. Okay. Okay, and so we can see here, uh, this is how we embed uh, the insert into fresh concrete, and we measure how much force is needed to pull out the, the insert. Uh, this is also a semi-destructive test uh, because when we put out the steel insert, uh, we have a corner of concrete also be removed. Okay, so we need to uh, patch the concrete surface after the test. Okay, so again, this test is also about uh, the surface hardness for the concrete. So that's the first category. 
the second category of NDT merit cert is to testing uh, physical properties uh, instead of uh, mechanical properties such as stress. Okay. Uh, we will discuss the so-called maturity method uh, and also absorption and permeability test. And then uh, ultrasound pulse velocity method. Uh, this is the method to de detect uh, internal flow uh, or somehow strength of the concrete. Uh, the first one is the maturity test. Uh, what is maturity? Okay. Uh, we know uh, the concrete hardens because of hydration. Okay. And the hydration is a chemical reaction between cement, powder, and water. Okay. And the degree of hydration depending on both the time and temperature. The longer the time, we have higher uh, degree of hydration. The higher the temperature, we also have uh, faster chemical reaction, uh, we have a higher degree of hydration. So uh, alpha degree of hydration depending on both, uh, depending both on time and temperature. And the strength of concrete may be evaluated uh, from the concept of maturity, okay? Which is basically a function of the time and uh, the curing temperature. So for measuring the maturity, uh, we monitor the temperature over the time, basically. Okay, and maturity M uh, is a function of uh, time times temperature. Okay, so basically the, the areas underneath the time and the temperature curve. Okay. Uh, however, we have something to take notes here. So uh, M is the maturity. Okay. D, T, T, A, and T0 are time interval. Okay. The average concrete temperature uh, during the time uh, interval DT, and also a so-called third time temperature, uh, which is T0 here. Okay. So T0 is the temperature uh, we assume hydration will stop, okay. Uh, Sometimes we use minus 10 degrees Celsius as their term temperature, okay. Uh, Sometimes we use zero degrees Celsius as their term temperature, okay. So when you calculate uh, maturity, which is again, the areas under the temperature and time curve, uh, remember that zero uh, may not be zero degree, okay. Uh, maybe minus 10 degrees Celsius, okay, depending on what the question tells us. Okay. Again, uh, T0 is called the time temperature, which is the temperature, uh, the hydration stops. Okay. Okay. I think in this example, we have two concrete. Uh, one concrete uh, is cured at 20 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. Okay. And the maturity based on the area is 720 degree Celsius hour. Okay. The other concrete has different temperature regions, but uh, the maturity is the same. Okay. So based on maturity master, these two concrete have the same maturity and it's supposed to have the same degree of hydration. So, The equipment to measure maturity uh, is very simple. So we need a data logger. Okay. Uh, we also need a, a so-called thermal copper, uh, which is like a Cooperware. Uh, one end of Cooperware is connected to the data logger. Uh, the other is inserted in the middle of concrete. Okay. So using data logger, we can monitor uh, the temperature versus time. So we can get the temperature versus time curve. Okay, so from there, uh, we can easily calculate the maturity for any type of concrete. Okay. 
Any questions so far? So here, talk about uh, potential issues with uh, maturity method. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so here shows you know, inference of current temperature at early age on strength and maturity relationship uh, when the equation uh, one, uh, which is the equation in the previous slides, okay, uh, is used. Okay. So what we can see here is uh, the x axis is maturity. And the Y cell is the actual strength of concrete. Okay. So based on maturity uh, concept, the concrete has the same maturity, should have the same strength. Okay, at least for the concrete with the same mixed design. Okay, however, that's not exactly the case, as we can see from here. Uh, these are actually two identical concrete the same uh, concrete with the same mixed design, but they cure at two temperature, okay? So one concrete cure at lower temperature and the other one has cure at temperature, but uh, the curve does not, does not truly match to each other, okay? So that tells us uh, when the two concrete has the same maturity, it does not necessarily has the same stress. Okay, so that tells us, uh, you know, uh, the maturity uh, idea is not uh, uh, very uh, accurate when they assess the strength of concrete. Um, I wonder, yes. um, what about if you're pouring concrete and maybe there's like two high the difference between day temperatures and night temperatures is big. It, how that affects roughly, uh, uh, like this know, trend? Yeah, roughly you can estimate, uh, estimate the maturity based on the temperature over the time. Okay, uh, but uh, you know, uh, as I said, uh, strengths cannot fully uh, estimate based on maturity itself. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's a small, difference, variance, okay. And, and my other question is like the temperature, it's affected more by the, by the first few hours of hydrating or? Yes. Or, mm -hmm. yeah. the, the temperature so, so, if you have, so if you have a place that has like different ranges of temperature, it's better to like pour later in the afternoon so you it can be during the night, during the first hydration or? Yeah, if the high temperature, you know, much too high temperature is not good for concrete. So during the summer, if you concern about uh, high thermal temperature cracking, uh, you may want to cast the concrete uh, when the temperature is cooled down you know, in the late afternoon, okay? But in the winter time, uh, you do not want the concrete to freeze. So that you may want to cast the concrete during noon time when the, when the outside temperature is high. Okay. But most of the heat is generated because of the hydration between cement and the water. Okay. Mm. All right. uh, next, let's look at the master to measure absorption and permeability of concrete. Okay. I mean, no permeability is very important, important uh, to control the concrete durability. Okay. The rate of water absorption by capillary suction uh, is a very good measurement of the quality of concrete, okay. and also its potential durability when exposed to uh, aggressive environment. Okay, uh, the lower the value, the better. So lower value of absorption means uh, aggressive iron such as chloride or water, we have more difficult time to penetrate the concrete and do the damage. Okay. And uh, the water absorption values are affected by 
water similar ratio, uh, current time, uh, current temperature, and also how much consolidation we introduce to the concrete. Permeability or permission uh, is to describe the mass transport of liquid or gas okay, uh, introduced by difference in pressure or gradient in concentration or by capillary forces. Okay. So that's a three different potential reasons uh, for the movement of uh, liquid and gas. So pressure head, concentration gradient or capital force, okay. And permission is affected by the volume and the connectivity of the force. The higher uh, the pore volume, uh, the more connected of the pores, we have a higher permeability. So we can measure uh, the air permeability of concrete, uh, which means how much air can permit through the concrete. Okay. Uh, air permeability of concrete increase when the moisture inside the concrete is uh, dried off. Okay. Uh, because uh, when the pores is dried off, the connectivity of the pores will increase. Okay. And the water absorption will also increase when the capillary pores are dries off when the pores are empty. Okay. So here shows the, the initial surface absorption test. Okay. So let's measure the water absorption under uh, field condition. Okay. So basically we have concrete samples and uh, we have a reservoir uh, where we put water. Okay. And uh, we measure the water flow into the concrete specimen uh, going through a certain surface area. Okay. And the result is affected by existing moisture condition inside the concrete and also uh, how clean the surface is. Okay, so that's the very short uh, introduction about uh, absorption method and permeability test. Okay. Uh, there's uh, many different ways to do that. Uh, we just give you a short introduction for that. Uh, the next category is a stress wave propagation method, okay. uh, including uh, ultrasound. Uh, but first of all, uh, let's look at waves, the basic of waves. Uh, the definition of waves uh, is a disturbance of vari variations that transfer energy okay, from point A to point B in the medium. Okay. So that medium could be concrete, could be steel, could be air, uh, sometimes even could be vacuum. Okay. And uh, the energy could be in the form of elastic deformation, such as uh, Mechanical wave, when we use a hammer to pound the concrete, it will send a mechanical wave in the form of elastic deformation. Okay. Or in the form of radiation of pressure, such as wind, or in the form of electric or magnetic intensity. Uh, we're gonna discuss the next of ground penetrating radar. Okay. So they use the EM wave to measure uh, uh, floors inside that concrete, okay, or even electric potential or temperature uh, variance. All right. So for the waves, we have a so-called amplitude, uh, which is the maximum displacement the wave can generate. Okay. As we can see here, uh, the amplitude is here, okay. And the dotted line is a neutral point. So that's the, the maximum dis displacement of the wave. And the period is the time between two successive wave crests. Okay. For example, the highest point, uh, two consecutive highest point 
the time difference is called period. Okay. And the distance between two successive wave crests, uh, we call that wave length, okay, uh, lambda, as we can see from here. Okay, so amplitude, period T, and uh, wave length. Okay. So that's the basic information about certain wave. So let's look at mechanical wave first. Uh, when we use a hammer, for example, to pump the surface of concrete, okay, it will send stress waves, okay, not only one, but multiple waves inside the medium, such as concrete. Okay. Uh, the waves can be in the form of so-called longitudinal waves. Okay, uh, we also call that L waves. Okay, uh, that is due to uh, elastic response of compression of the medium. Okay. The shear, elastic response to shear of the medium, uh, that wave is called transverse wave or T wave. Okay, and the velocity of L wave and T wave are different. So with L wave has the highest velocity. Uh, the second one is T wave, T wave. Uh, the third wave is called R wave, okay, uh, which is also called surface wave. Uh, that's the wave propagated only on interface between two medium, such as the concrete and air. Okay. So R wave has the slowest uh, velocity. So the P wave is also called primary waves. Uh, another name is called compression wave. Uh, that is due to uh, elastic response under compression. Okay. If we focus on one particle here, okay, we can see the particle is moved from left to right in the same direction as uh, the direction of the wave. Okay. And compression wave can propagate in solid, liquid, and gas. Okay, so actually any materials which has an elastic response to compression, uh, compression wave can propagate in that medium. Okay, again, any materials has elastic response to compression, then the compression wave can propagate in that medium. And the governing parameters for P wave is uh, the Young's motors E value, and also the density of the medium. Right. Uh, the second wave is called shear wave, uh, secondary wave, or transverse wave. Okay, the same thing. Uh, again, focus on the difference between the direction of particle motion. Okay. The direction of particle motion is up and down, okay. which is perpendicular to the direction of travel of the wave, which is from left to right. Okay. Uh, shear wave can propagate in solid, but cannot propagate in liquid and gas. The reason is for is because uh, for solid it has elastic response to shear, but for liquid and gas uh, it does not have very strong elastic response to shear. So that's the reason where why shear wave can only propagate in solid, but not in liquid and gas. And the governing factor for shear wave is the shear modulus. G and also the density of the materials. Okay. Again, uh, shear waves cannot propagate in fluid and gas because fluid and gas has no elastic response to shear. Okay. Right. And this slide shows the basic of acoustic. Okay. The correlation between 
uh, wave velocity V, uh, the frequency and the wave lapse. Okay, I mean no. The frequency is equal to one over T, uh, which is the period of the wave. Okay, so uh, frequency is equal to one over T, the period. Uh, which is defined as how many circles or how many period within one second. Okay. And the wavelength is distance between uh, successive crests. Okay. So the velocity of the wave is equal to frequency times the wavelength. Okay. And wave velocity is material properties. Okay. So what does that mean? So that means uh, Within certain medium, such as a concrete, uh, the velocity of the wave uh, does not depend on the frequency. Yeah. And here shows the frequency range for different type of uh, wave, right? from infrasound, uh, which is less than 15, 20 hertz. Okay. Uh, example of Infrasound is uh, earthquake. Uh, earthquake may generate infrasound. Uh, elephant or whales uh, can also use infrasound to communicate. Uh, the big advantage of infrasound is it can propagate over hundreds or even thousands of miles. Okay. So the energy dissipation for infrasound is very low. Okay, that's the reason why it can propagate over long distance between 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz is called audio sound. Audio sound. So that's the wavelength frequency a human being can hear. Between 20,000 to one gigahertz is called ultrasound. Okay. So for NTT, we use this range from 20K to one gigahertz. Okay. And beyond one gigahertz is called Hypersound. Okay, so for hypersound, it can not propagate in a very long distance. Okay, so actually, it cannot propagate in air because the wavelength is very, very small. Okay, uh, why is small wavelength? Because the frequency is very high. Okay, and uh, because of that, the energy dissipation for hypersound is very fast, uh, so fast that it cannot propagate in air. We use ultrasound for NDT uh, due to these reasons. Okay, uh, because uh, it travel relatively slow, and ultrasound wave can easily penetrate uh, opaque materials such as steel and concrete. And the equipment to generate uh, ultrasound is uh, not as extensive as other others. So we choose what type of frequency for concrete. Okay. We need to balance between uh, the penetration and accuracy. Okay. The higher the F, higher the frequency, uh, the wavelength will be smaller okay. because uh, the speed does not change. So higher frequency, the wavelength will be smaller. Okay. Lower frequency, the wavelength will be larger. Smaller wavelengths, we have better resolution. Okay, we can see more in more details, but uh, because the energy dissipated faster, uh, the penetration will be uh, shallower. So we have smaller penetration. Okay. On the other hand, uh, lower frequency, we have a longer, larger wavelengths. Okay. Uh, larger wavelengths, we have smaller uh, resolution, okay. but the penetration will be deeper. Okay. Although we cannot see uh, in much details. So we need to balance between resolution and penetration. Okay. So for concrete, what we normally do is we choose uh, the frequency of the wave so that the wavelength is similar to the size of the course average. Okay. So uh, the normal size for course average is around three quarter inch to uh, an inch. Okay. So uh, because of that, 
the frequency for concrete uh, is around uh, 200,000 Hertz. Okay, so if you do the calculation, uh, the velocity is equal to frequency times lambda, the wave length. Okay, uh, if you use frequency of 200,000, okay, uh, that times uh, the lambda of typical size of, uh, uh, sorry, if you use 200,000 Hertz and the wave speed is around 2,000 meter per second. Okay. So velocity divided by frequency, you get a wave length, uh, which is around two centimeter. Okay. So wave length is around the size of course aggregate based on this calculation. Okay. So we choose that wave length uh, so the wave can go around the course aggregate and propagate deeper, penetrate deeper, but the energy uh, will not, you know, the resolution will be high enough. Okay, so that's how we balance between resolution and penetration. So for ultrasound techniques, uh, we could have a so-called wave transmission method, okay, where uh, the transmitter and the receiver are two different units. Okay, so one side of the specimen we have a transmitter, and the other side we have a, a receiver. Okay, on two sides of a specimen. Okay, we could also use the wave reflection method where the transmitter and the receiver is in the same unit right here. Uh, the white material here is the, another medium uh, which can ensure the wave inside the specimen, in this case is a steel, can be reflected back and received by the receiver. Okay, so uh, again, for the wave reflection method, uh, the transmitter and the receiver uh, in the same unit uh, but for the wave transmission method, uh, the transmitter and the receiver are on the opposite, opposite side of the specimen. So in ultrasound pulse velocity method or UPV method, uh, the transmitter and the receiver are on the opposite of the concrete. Okay. So the transmitter will send the ultrasound. Okay, uh, the ultrasound will go through the concrete and receive the by the receiver. Okay, and uh, we can calculate the velocity based on this unit easily. Okay, and the higher velocity uh, means the strength of the concrete will be higher. Also means uh, we may have less floors inside the the concrete. Okay. So that's a, the weight correlation between the velocity and the strength of concrete. Okay. You can also measure the, the uniformity of in-place concrete. Okay. So what we do is we measure uh, on different heights of the specimen, we measure the velocity. If in certain location, the velocity is much lower than other location, then probably in that height, uh, we may have some, uh, uh, for example, honeycombing inside the concrete. Okay. And that the equation for the velocity of the materials, okay, which is a function of uh, modulus of elasticity, and the Poisson's ratio, and also the density of the concrete. And the UPV method is not reliable without uh, opposite inside. So we need a receiver and uh, transmitter on the two different side of the concrete. Okay. So this is the, the table for acceptance criteria based on the velocity we measured and uh, the general condition of the concrete. Okay, again, this is a pretty rough uh, estimation for concrete condition. Uh, it is mostly used to check uh, if we have a large air gap in the concrete okay, at different location. Okay. 
Transmitter and receiver can also be on one side. Okay, so the transmitter will send a wave, okay, and the wave will be reflected back to the receiver at the interface between the specimen and the air. Uh, we could also have one transmitter and many receiver, okay, as we can see here. Okay. So if we set up the machine like this, okay, uh, we can plot uh, something like this uh, as a function of distance from the transmitter and uh, transmitting uh, transmission time. Okay, and based on that, uh, we can calculate uh, the velocity of the wave inside the materials. Uh, which can also give us the uh, idea of the condition of the materials. So here shows the, the famous Snell's law, okay, uh, which is governing the, uh, the angles for refraction and the diffraction. Okay. So let's see if we have two medium. Okay. So material one, and material two, okay. so the wave in material one has uh, velocity v1, and the wave in material two has velocity v2. Okay. So if you say we have uh, the wave with incident angle of theta one, and part of wave will be reflected by back, okay. uh, use the same uh, reflected angle theta one, uh, we call that reflected wave. And part of the wave will penetrate, uh, we call that refracted wave. And theta two will be different from theta one, uh, which is depending on the velocity v1 or v2. Okay, uh, Snell's law governing the correlation between theta one, theta two, and v1 and v2. Okay, and based on that, uh, we can calculate the so-called first critical angle. So what is first critical angle? Let's read it here. Okay. So when a longitudinal wave, uh, which is the, the wave due to compression, move from a slower to a faster medium, such as from air to concrete, so that's the incident angle that makes the angle of refraction, okay, which is uh, theta two here, equal to 90 degree. So we make theta two equal to 90 degree then the refractive wave will travel along the interface. Okay, and based on this equation, uh, we can calculate the first critical angle, which is a function of V1 and V2. Based on that, we can, all right, we can detect Inside the materials, if we have many different layers, okay, because if different layers exist, then the velocity will change. Okay, so this is the, for for example, we have two type of materials underneath the air. Okay, a transmitter is here, a receiver is here. Okay, so the transmitter will send a wave, and receiver will receive the wave. There's are two different paths, okay? So path one is directly from transmitter to the receiver, okay? And path two, okay, is along this, okay? Uh, which is the incident angle equal to 90 degree, which means the theta two equal to 90 degree. Okay, and based on this, So we can plot two curves, uh, one is for pass one, and uh, the slope for the curve is a function of velocity, one, we want, okay, so one over velocity. And also similarly for pass two, we have another curve, and the slope of that curve is one over V2, okay. And based on that, uh, we can calculate the thickness of the layers, which is H, okay? So you do not need to know the details how to calculate the thickness, 
uh, but you should know this uh, uh, snail's law. Uh, we can detect if underneath the materials we have different layers, and even we can measure the thickness of the layers. Okay. All right. So let's uh, stop here. Uh, next time uh, we're also going to continue discuss uh, NDT methods, uh, including uh, ultrasound and also ground, pen, ground, ground penetration radar, the GPR method. Okay. So let's stop here for today. Any questions for today's lecture? Well, okay. <clears throat>